Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the annual general meeting of um, Cromwell Corporation Limited. I'm Jeff Levy. I'm the chairman of the prop of the Cromwell Property Group. And before we open the meeting, I'd just like to introduce you to uh, my fellow directors. Um, starting on my right here is our CEO, um, Paul Wakeman. Uh, to my left, there's Daryl Wilson, Michelle McKellar. Robert Puller, Mike Waters, David Usas, and Richard right at the end over there, Richard Foster. So um, we have uh, two absentees, um, um, Mark Weiner, who's in South Africa. Um, he had, did have prior commitments, tried his best, but was unable to get here for today. Um, and I'd also like to just acknowledge, uh, we've got um, Jeff Cannings down here, who's the alternate for Mark and Mike when one of them's away or not. And uh, one of our directors elect, Jane, um, is down here as well. Um, and I'd also like to just acknowledge our auditors, um, Nigel Batters and his team over there from Pritchard Partners, um, who later on, if anyone has questions, can feel free to ask. All right, so now I have to call the meeting to order. And again, I apologize for reading the speech and everything directly from the script, but that's um, because it's going to be put up on the ASEC website. I've got to make sure that what I say to you in the script is the same as what other people are reading over there. So, um, and first of all, I'd also like to welc you, welcome you for the first time in our lovely new offices. Well, it's our old office, just we, we've just uh, given it a good renovation. <coughs> Um, and it's a classic example of the great work that the Cromwell team can put together where we've taken an older building and turned it into something like this. So this is the first time we're having an AGM over here in our, on our, our new reception floor. And I must tell you, having seen some people are looking at um, taking floors in this building, when they come up here and they see what we've done and the way the offices work, they get very impressed and they can't believe they're walking into you know, a building like this and not one of the brand new ones down on the, the water there and it's been a very good competitive edge for us. So, um, you know, congratulations to Paul and the whole team for putting all of this together and have done it well within budget, etc. So it's excellent. Um, now just moving on to the formalities of everything. Cromwell continues to active, actively manage its portfolio and its assets and to adapt to changing conditions in property markets. We bought assets at attractive prices when property markets were weak between 2009 and 2013. And as prices have risen in the, in the last year, we've actually sold non-core assets at prices higher than our view of their long-term values. The proceeds of sales from non-core properties have been used to buy assets to which we can add value through active management and to strengthen our balance sheet in anticipation of increased volatility in the future. I'm proud that we continue to maintain strong discipline in our acquisition and sale processes. And I believe this discipline is a major reason we were able to improve on all our key financial performance measures in 2014. Cromwell, Cromwell's key objective is to provide a secure, and growing distribution to our security holders. And it, is, and it was pleasing that we were able to continue to increase distributions per security in financial year 2014. The growth of our funds management business is an important part of our strategy to continue increasing these distributions. I'm pleased to report that the fund management business grew strongly in financial year 14 through the launch of new funds and the continuing strong performance of existing funds. We plan to continue to grow the funds management business in the current year and beyond with new syndicates and funds and by the expansion of our platform as opportunities present themselves. The acquisition of a stake in a, in a New Zealand fund manager Oyster Group during the year is an example of the type of opportunity that we may pursue in future years. During 2014, we restructured our debt facilities, extending our weighted average debt maturity to approximately four years and achieving much greater flexibility and lower cost of debt. 
Since the end of the financial year, we have also entered into hedging arrangements, capping our exposure to future interest payments on one billion of debt for five years. Our achievements reinforce to me, and I hope to all of you security holders, Cromwell's key points of difference to our peers. We actively manage our portfolio instead of passively accumulating assets. We use gearing intelligently through the property cycle. And finally, we are able to produce value from our funds management business. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank in particular Paul Waitman and all of the group's executives and staff for their continued dedicated and hard work. We are proud of the fact that we tread our own path and that we continue to outperform our peers over the medium and long term. I would also like to thank my fellow board members for their support during the year. In particular, I'd like to um, thank David Usas and Mike Waters, both of whom reached the end of their respective terms at the end of this meeting. David has been, it's an understatement to say, an enthusiastic independent director since he joined our board in 2007. He has provided very strong financial and risk management stewardship as chairman of our audit and risk committee and as a member of the nominations and remuneration committee and adding immeasurably to the collegiate atmosphere on the board to the benefit of all stakeholders. We wish David all the very best for the future and I'd like you to join me in a customary manner. Thank you. Um, it is also uh, bittersweet <laughs> to, um, to, uh, um, to point out Mike Waters, who is the CEO of Redefine International PLC. He joined the board 2011 and his financial and property expertise has proven to be great advantage to the group. Our strong relationship with Mike will continue as, re as Redefine remain a strong supporter of the group. To, and um, I'd like to take this opportunity also to thank Mike in our customary manner. Thank you. Today, you will be asked to elect Jane Tongs as a new independent director and to elect Andrew Koenig, who is the CEO of Redefined Properties Limited, also as a new director. Ms. Tongs was a partner at PricewaterhouseCoopers for nearly 10 years. And since then, she has had extensive experience as a non-executive director, serving on the boards of insurance, funds management, superannuation, and other financial service entities, as well as private sector companies and government organizations. The board is confident that Mrs. Tong's significant non-executive director experience and extensive financial risk management and governance exper expertise will be of great benefit to the board and to all our security holders. Also, Andrew Koenig, who is a chartered accountant in South Africa and has been the CEO of Redefined Properties Limited since August this year, he will be joining us, as I said earlier. Mr. Koenig will bring considerable financial and commercial skills to the board. Finally, I'd love to thank all of you, our security holders, for your ongoing support, and I look forward to another strong year in 2015. It now gives me great pleasure to call on our CEO, Mr. Paul Waitman, to address you. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you to all of our security holders and guests for joining us here today, and welcome to our new old premises. Cromwell's board and management are, were particularly pleased with the group's performance in the 2014 financial year. A 43% increase in operating profit to a record $146.7 million reflected the benefit of acquisitions made in the 2013 financial year. An increase in like-for-like -like income from our portfolio, reduced interest costs, an increase in funds management earnings, and all this resulted in an increase in operating earnings per security of 12% to 8.5 cents per security. Once again, the group's financial performance was driven in large part by the performance of our property portfolio. 
And we work hard to maintain a property portfolio that has a solid base of dependable earnings, balanced with a small number of opportunistic assets that provide outperformance either because of the way in which we are able to buy them, timing or their potential to be improved or repositioned. During FY14 and into the current year, we continued to improve the quality of the portfolio, selling seven properties for $458 million and acquiring a half share of North Point Tower in North Sydney for $278 million. North Point is the foundation of a new unlisted wholesale investment trust, the Cromwell Partners Trust, managed by Cromwell and owned 50-50 by Cromwell and Redefined Properties. We believe there's a tremendous opportunity to improve the property by repositioning its retail offering, by adding additional com accommodation and by improving car parking and commercial office rentals. As a result of the acquisition of the New South Wales portfolio from the Government of New South Wales in June 2013 and North Point Tower in December 2013, we now have a much larger exposure to the Sydney office market and that was based on our view that Sydney would benefit most strongly from the transition in the Australian economy following the slowing of the mining and resources investment boom. And that view has been vindicated by the recent decline in vacancy rates in the Sydney market and in rising expectation of effective rental growth in that market. In FY14, net earnings from the portfolio increased by 24% to $214.4 million. This was primarily due to the additional income from assets acquired in FY13, as well as increased rental from the Qantas Global Headquarters in Sydney, um, the refurbishment of which we completed during the year. The increase included like-for-like like growth in rental of 1.4%, which was a good result and outperformed the overall national office market. We also reported a modest increase in portfolio property valuations with an increase in, in investment property value of $46.2 million net of capital expenditure and incentives. I think this increase in valuations highlights the continued appetite for commercial property despite the concerns generally in the market about rental income growth. We expect further increases in value and we also can see in markets like Sydney, rents showing signs of bottoming, although we expect the recovery across the board to be slow. Our portfolio has a very strong tenant profile with government and government owned corporations contributing 50% of rental income and listed blue chip, co chip companies or their subsidiaries a further 29%. The portfolio has a weighted average lease expiry profile of 5.9 years and vacancy of just 3.2%, far lower than the national CBD office average of 12%. We've consistently maintained occupancy levels in the portfolio above national benchmark occupancy rates, in large part as a direct result of our internal management model. We'll continue to be highly responsive to changing market conditions by adjusting and refining the portfolio to maximise security value, security holder returns and value over rolling three and five year periods. NTA per security increased during the year from 70 cents to 73 cents, primarily as a result of those property revaluations. We reduced gearing from 46% at the end of FY13 to 42% at the end of FY14 and following the balance date, we sold Exhibition Street, reducing gearing further to 37%, which is at the lower end of our group's preferred range of 35 to 55%. The most important capital management initiative during the year was the restructuring of our debt platform. We finalised a new $1.02 billion platform that replaced seven existing debt facilities. The platform consolidated all but two of our existing, uh, pre-existing debt facilities. The new facility extended our weighted average debt maturity from 1.4 years to 3.9 years and reduced the weighted average margin across all facilities. 
The new facility is both flexible and cost effective and provides an innovative financing platform that will assist us to fund future growth. In August, we also took advantage of historically low interest rate volatil the volatility environment to extend our hedging profile. In FY14, the group's earnings from external funds management activities rose 65% to $5.5 million. And we now have external assets under management of $1.3 billion and total assets under management of more than $3.7 billion. We continue to expand the range of our managed investments, launching three new unlisted property trusts, all of which have performed strongly. We also acquired a 50% stake in New Zealand property and fund manager Oyster Group for $7.5 million New Zealand dollars. Our reputation and track record continues to grow with each successful investment and we continue to work towards our long-term goal for funds management to contribute 20% of group earnings. In the year ahead, we expect to see continued strong demand for property with long leases, with demand for CBD assets expanding to include near city, fringe and suburban locations. Australian office yields are still high by international benchmarks, so overseas demand can be expected to continue, maintaining downward pressure on yields. This means that acquisition opportunities that meet our value matrix may be harder to find in the near term. Despite the strength in investment markets, we expect rental markets to remain soft in the short term across all sectors. We'll be partially insulated from this because our portfolio has relatively low vacancy levels and minimal lease expiries in FY15. FY and while we have a number of larger lease expiries in FY16 and 17, management and the board have stressed, placed strong emphasis on renewing or releasing those tenancies well ahead of expiry. We believe active management and availability of capital will be keys to future performance. We'll continue to adjust our portfolio ahead of changing market conditions. We'll also maintain a strong balance sheet with low debt and good cash reserves that will leave us well positioned to take advantage of any opportunities that arise if there's any market correction or downturn. And in this regard, recent volatility in bond and equity markets provides, provides a salient reminder that domestic and global economies continue to face a range of challenges. A change in global investor sentiment is a distinct risk in the current environment. Bond markets, which have been at historical highs, are already under pressure and we're only now recovering from a short-lived correction in equity markets in October. Without wishing to be unduly pessimistic, if we look at macro conditions in the world, there are a lot of things that could go wrong. The end of quantitative easing in the US, an increase in QE in Japan and Europe, looser monetary policy in China, all have the impact, the potential to impact on global investor confidence and investment flows. Major economies in Europe continue to struggle. The geopolitical environment in the Middle East remains tes tense and terrorism threats remain high. The ultimate impact of any of these risks escalating can be a reduction in liquidity and we all saw that in the global financial crisis and from that period and from previous cycles we know that markets that people regard as highly liquid as they currently are can very quickly become illiquid. We believe that many investors are currently basing their investment decisions on the assumption that liquidity will remain high and interest rates will remain low. And that's a risky approach because in an environment of low or no real liquidity, assets being acquired with the intention of resale simply may not be able to be sold. And again, we saw that in 2008-09. So while we're not predicting any sort of global meltdown anytime soon, Prudent businesses build in safeguards to minimise the potential impact of any shock. And as I've highlighted earlier, we've already taken steps to reduce debt and to strengthen our balance sheet. Another thing we know that is if liquidity is tight, interest rates will go up as competition for money increases. 
by hedging our interest rates, we're well positioned to weather any future rate rises. On the positive side, I think what we've learnt from the last cycle is that modestly geared income producing property can provide a safe haven against global shocks. Most of the damage that was done in the GFC was caused by entities being highly geared and forced to recapitalise with very expensive equity. And as it did during the GFC, our strong balance sheet and the quality of our underlying assets leave us well positioned for that sort of environment and generally for the future. Cromwell's been able to deliver consistent distribution growth through the cycle and this continues to be our priority for the future. We forecast FY15 EPS of at least 8.3 cents and we're targeting distribution per security growth of 3% over FY14 results. I'd like to thank US security holders and I'd like to thank our staff. Our staff for their efforts during the year and their continued focus and dedication going forward. I assure you at the heart of Cromwell's business strategy is a concern for our investors. Our investors come first. I'd like to thank the board for their guidance over the last 12 months. As will be obvious, our success is very much the result of a team effort. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Paul. Um, so now we're gonna have to get into the items of business and the more formal part of the meeting. Um, those security holders and proxy holders who have registered to vote will have received a yellow voting card. A non-voting attendee should have received a blue non-voting card and visitors should have received a green card. Um, a number of proxies have been received and in accordance with the requirements of the Corporations Act 2001, details of all proxies in respect of the resolutions will be recorded in the minutes irrespective of whether the motion is voted on by a show of hands or not. I will advise details of the proxies which have been received before the resolution is discussed. You should note that for all resolutions, I intend to vote undirected proxies in favour of the resolutions. I take this opportunity to note that each director holds Com Cromwell Property Group Security has voted in favour of all resolutions, except of course where they are excluded by virtue of the Corporations Act from voting or by the, or by the ASX, ASX listing rules. Shortly, security holders will be asked to vote on the resolutions to be put to the meeting. You will ha also have an opportunity to ask questions or discuss the specific resolutions. Um, all right. Um, so, firstly, I'm going to move to the notice of meeting. Uh, this was sent within the notice period required to send the Corporations Act and the Constitution of Cromwell Corporation Limited. Accordingly, I move that the notice be taken as read. All the, um, is there a seconder? Thank you. All those in favour? Anyone against? No, thank you very much. We'll move on. I declare the motion carried. The minutes of the last annual general meeting were approved by the board and have been signed as a correct record. The minute books are available for inspection by security holders if required. Um, we'll now move to the financial report. Cromwell's 2014 annual report, which contains a financial report, director's report, and the auditor's report of the company for the year ended 30 June 2014, has been made available to security holders. This resolution for consideration by the meeting is intended to provide an opportunity for security, security holders to raise questions on the report and on the performance of the, of the group generally. Um, so now I'm going to invite discussion and ask anyone who wants to ask any questions. As I said, please raise your card, tell us who you are before you do so. Uh, we also have, I remind you, we also have Nigel uh, Bitters of, of uh, Pritchard Partners available as the auditor for any questions, if anyone has any of those questions. Um, so, anybody, any questions? Yes, sir. <laughs> We're going to give you a, a, a speaker so you don't have to scream. 
But you look very uh, Queenslandy in your shirt there for us. I'm a evening. casual approach this year. <laughs> yeah. But I see that they, I've been joined by Robert Puller, but he's retiring off the board. No. And I think he's saying, well, I'm off the board now. I'm not going to wear a tie. <laughs> Notice he's the only one without a tie on the whole of the board. I don't uh, think uh, Mich Michelle's also not wearing a tie. <laughs> Michelle's not wearing a tie. But uh, first of all, I'd like to hand out a few bouquets. A uh, marvelous set of results, Paul, and your presentation I thought was very, very good. Uh, and the job that you've done up here in the building is fantastic. Uh, the three floors that you've done up are really marvelous. I, I was a bit disappointed when I walked up. This is the first time I've ever been in this building. And I walk up the street from the, the Stamford Hotel, and the first thing I look is, gee, the maintenance in this building's not too good. Has anyone had a look at the two pillars as you come in the front door with all the tiles missing? So hopefully that will be fixed up very shortly. <laughs> it was the storm last week. No? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the results are, are, are very, very good. And you've every reason to feel very pleased with yourself. But what I wanted to comment on very, very favorably was the newsletter which I received, uh, the last one. And I thought, what a professional uh, letter. Well presented, good articles, and it must be very, very useful for the people who are trying to get new people into Cromwell. Somewhere in the report that said something about you got 5,000 investors, is that right? 4,000 active investors and about 25,000 investors who are keen on investing in our products. Uh, there was something there about 20,000 potential investors. Mm. That's a very modest figure, Paul, and we've got a population of 20 million. I think we should increase that. <laughs> well, they, they all have to um, achieve certain qualifications to get there, and they all have to be man people of your sort of standard and reputation, Andrew. So <laughs> you'd agree that there aren't 20 million of those in the country. <laughs> However, on a serious note, I, I'm a bit concerned as to uh, how we're faring against the other REITs in Australia. And I noticed I was reading where uh, companies like GPT, Dexas, Stockland, Charter Hall and Investor are paying dividends which are not covered either out of the free cash flow or the operational cash flow. Perhaps someone could run me through, one for Darrell there. How do we stand on our dividends against our cash flow? I'm happy, I'm happy for Darrell to do it, but we never pay money, we never pay dividend distributions um, out of money we haven't earned. So where a lot of these other, and, it, and, it, and we saw it in the GFC where I think Cromwell was the only REIT in Australia listed that did not have to do a dilutive capital raising because we had not done revaluations and gone borrowed more from the banks against those revaluations in order to keep the distribution up. We only ever paid money out of money we earned. In fact, we, we don't pay the full amount of all the money we earn. We pay up to a certain, up to a certain amount of our actual earnings and, um, and, and we've been very uh, careful about that and we probably go against the tide and you know when, when, it's, when it's popular to for these people, it gets difficult when uh, yields are coming down and everything to keep the distribution up. And so therefore they revalue assets, they borrow a little bit more, or they go and they find other ways to do it. Um, I can't comment on each group's what they're actually doing, but that article sounds very reminiscent of 2006 and 2007 when we had institutional um, shareholders coming to us and, and grab all the Paul and Daryl and others and say, why have you got such a lazy balance sheet? Why aren't you, you know, using it? Why aren't you paying out future value effectively? Um, just goes against the grain for us. And yes, we will swim against the tide occasionally, but we will we will be very, very 
strict about ensuring that we can only pay out what we earn out of profits and we can't pay away the future and uh, and that's the only way we're going to try and keep your distribution consistent and constant and um, that's what we do to date and that's what we hope to continue to do. Daryl, do you want to comment on any of the other groups? I'm not going to comment on any of the groups and I, I possibly couldn't add any more to that, Jeff. I think you said that very, very well. So, yeah, and I, I think, well, I will say one thing is that I just harp the point that we do what we think what's right. Uh, that isn't necessarily what everyone else is doing and in particular, it's likely at extreme points in the cycle we'll be doing the exact opposite of what a lot of others are doing for, for what we think are very good reasons. So keep an eye out for that. As, as Paul mentioned earlier, and I also alluded to the fact that we've actually sold some assets in this uh, last year, some assets that are actually great assets. Other people obviously really like them. We didn't sell them because we just wanted to sell them. We sold them because the price that we were being offered based on our assessment of the future value exceeded what we felt that would be. And yes, that meant that we've got less rental income coming from those properties in the meantime. But what we do have is a profit on that sale, which we can use to reinvest into something better if we find it, or else give it back to you when the time comes that if we can't find something better to do with it, that makes sure that you get the right return. So um, yes, a lot of people are buying and not selling, and where we've seen an appropriate time to sell, that's what we've done. Any other questions? Yes. No, we sell properties with, with with our spare cash. We a we we pretty much pay down debt because we're paying interest on that debt anyway, and we also keep that money for opportunities which we see. When we do a a, a fund management uh, um, asset acquisition in a syndicate or in within the DPF or one of our dis, uh, one of our funds, uh, it's it's designed to cater for the a yield criteria or earnings criteria or growth criteria of that particular fund. That's a different issue. We haven't sold from our balance sheet to a fund, for example. We've sold to third parties. Yeah. And probably just to clarify what I said, last year we sold some assets. We also bought an asset. The way we structured the acquisition of that asset was to buy half share with one of our partners because the size of the asset represented too big a risk for our balance sheet by itself. So that investment concentration risk was something we considered very carefully and we decided whilst we wanted to manage it and deliver the upside result ourselves, we didn't want to have the whole of the risk on balance sheet. So the structure of that is an unlisted trust with one of our shareholders. Does any, is that a any further elaboration? Any other questions? Yes, sir. Well, from growing it. By, by that I mean by finding product which is um, both attractive and valuable to investors, where they can have, where they want exposure to that particular type of product and investing directly in it. The advantage for us is that of having that sort of a business is that we don't have to actually buy the asset with our own capital and just get the normal return on it. So we don't deploy as much capital. We get outside capital without diluting our main balance sheet. And what we therefore do is we earn a fee for managing it for those investors, which they're very happy because they're getting well-managed assets and they're going to want to keep investing um, either their super funds or their increase or their institutions into further assets, which we can't really hold on our balance sheet without diluting everybody's earnings. So we've created a way to actually buy those assets, fund them, and, and they don't necessarily have to be just pure, in, in a fund management business, they don't have to be pure property assets from time to time. We've got a, we've got a skill base now, and we've built a platform to allow us to examine looking at other ways of increasing that fund management business. I think the fund management business has actually got quite a lot of upside with very little capital investment required. We 
we have a lot of um, competition from Chinese uh, investors in acquiring properties and as a result we haven't been because often they're prepared to pay a lot more than we think we prepare to pay so um, that's why we've actually sold some properties because the market has been pushed to levels where in certain categories and certain types of properties we don't believe we can add more value to that property and therefore if someone's prepared to pay more than we think you will get over the next 10 years basically we're happy to sell it um, we don't believe in profitless prosperity growth for the sake of growth yeah nor does my wife so she made me go and die sorry <laughs> Any further questions? One facetious question. I couldn't help but notice going through the annual report that uh, two or three of your buildings, the values had gone down. And I thought, that's strange. Then I realized that the ones I was looking at were in Canberra. And my question is, is it anything to do with the past government or the existing government or the budget, which is supposed to be so unfair, why did the Canberra buildings go back? Well, th this is when a good chairman does the following thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's called a flick pass. Yeah. So the, the Canberra market at the moment is pretty depressed. And the reason it's depressed is that on a change of government, um, or even before, the change of government, the Labor Party government introduced a redundancy round that identified about 12,500 public service jobs to be run out over a period of time. And the coalition government came in and identified more cuts, and there was a bit of a confusion about that, whether they were the old cuts or the new cuts. But the net result is that there's been a fairly substantial headcount reduction and a lot of belt tightening. and. We look at it as a similar sort of time in Canberra to when John Howard came in government, into government and had the infamous Razor Gang. Um, what the government has found is that the cuts that they envisaged aren't going to be possible because the Senate's blocked $9 billion a year of reductions in service programs. So that means a lot of the public servants that they have sacked or plan to sack won't be sackable because those programs will continue to be provided. We also see that there are a number of initiatives like the National Disability Insurance Scheme that require a lot of public servants to be hired. And given that we're one year in and we're, we've come to the end of the first cut year of a government, it's now focusing on re-election. So it's got to promise things for which it will need public servants. So in terms of numbers, we think we're probably at the bottom of where the Canberra market is. But as a result of that, when we get properties valued, those with shorter term lease profiles are valued by the valuer on the assumption that these cuts will either continue or headcounts will be reduced or the status quo will be maintained until the time of those lease expiries. So that leads the value to have a negative assessment on expiry of space requirements and rents. Now our expectation is that when these came up for renewal, expiry in 2017, which is still two and a bit years away, will actually be at a period of time where there will be more demand, so there'll be more upside. Net result of all of that is a, a market like Canberra will show a lot of volatility in values over the next few years. You know, we can buy assets in Canberra with two or three year um, lease profiles for double digit returns. If you want to buy an asset in Canberra with a 15-year lease, you've got to pay under 7%. And so that big gap between primary and secondary values presents buying opportunities. We're one of the very few who went into Canberra in the late 90s because that mindset was still um, very much foremost with institutional buyers that Canberra was a place you didn't want to go. But, you know, as those of you who participated in a number of our funds that were Canberra based. I think you, everybody did very nicely out of those in the late 90s, early 2000s. So that's where we think things will go. And the flip side of that coin is that um, you know, 
the value is like beauty. It's in the eye of the beholder. So when you have a look at some of the properties we have, we are in the process of selling, have sold or whatever, it's often at a price that's a lot more than the value I said that it was worth as well. So, you know, it's kind of a, the valuers know what history told them or, and whatever, you know, that day of whatever's happening next door. So well, that's what it is. Thank you. Paul oh. forgot to mention that the decline in Canberra and values was very minimal. It wasn't drastic. Yeah. Well, first of all, there were some important things for Canberra assets generally. So, I mean, our, our assets haven't been really hit at this stage. We expect that as, as you get closer to the end of that lease, you might see more impact. But we know that there have been big, big swings with assets owned by other parties. Um, any further questions, anybody? All right, there being no further questions, I'd like to move on to um, the first item which you have to vote on, and that's the approval of our remuneration report. Um, the, re the resolution reads that the company's remuneration report for the financial year ended 30 June 2014 is adopted. I'd remind security holders that this vote is advisory only and does not bind the directors of the company or the company. I note that details of the new legislation in relation to remuneration matters under the Corporation Act are included in an explanatory memorandum to the notice for meeting. Voting exclusions apply in relation to this resolution. The exclusions are also outlined in the notice of meeting, which is taken as read. However, I'm happy to have the company sent, uh, secretary read out any of these notices if anyone wants to hear them or really wants to be bored. Okay, so here are the proxies. Um, I assume you, you've all looked at that before we vote. Um, is there anyone who wants to speak to the motion? All right. Uh, yes, sir. Speak to well, about it. Whatever you prefer. Yes. Yeah, Malcolm Badgery from the Australian Shareholders Association. It just, it seems to me that, or, or, or do you, were you surprised at the number of um, proxy votes against the, uh, against the resolution? And were any of these proxy advised, did they have a view about your remuneration report? Um, we are not surprised because we, that there's three things the proxy gatekeepers uh, look at. Um, and we got two ticks and one cross. The cross was related to the fact that they felt that we do not have, and, and just so for those who don't know how this works, there are a bunch of institutions out there who vote, who, who own shares in companies, who haven't really, because they own, might own 80, 90, 100 companies, they don't actually get into the detail. So when it comes to the technical stuff like this, they go to what they call proxy advisors, who kind of, taken upon themselves as a group of them, they get paid a service to do this, to go through various criteria which they decide you should vote for or against. We got a cross out on one out of the three um, things, it wasn't about the amount, it wasn't about any of that stuff, it was by the fact that we did not put into our um, annual report exactly what the KPIs upon which we uh, judge um, our senior staff is. I'm proud to say we don't, because if we did, everyone would know our secret source. And if we did, furthermore, it would, it would, it would highlight to some of our competitors what, th what things are our concern in the coming year, what property we worried about getting released and everything. So as the a representative of the Australian uh, Shareholders Association, it would be really good if for once someone would go and sit with these proxy advisors and there's no doubt they do an amazing job and should do and, and your association does a wonderful job in keeping, as they say, the bastards honest, but this is really not one of those companies. Um, it's usually where someone's you know, paying themselves tens of million dollars as a CEO and where the chairman and the board are you know, all in the, in, in the, the millions of dollars, etc. It, it, that's where the concern usually comes. This is not one of those companies um, so, yes, that we weren't surprised when we heard that that, that that was one of the things one of the proxy advisors gave. The other thing you should note that that against 11 actually is only of the proxies which represents less than 5 or around 5%, just under 5% of the actual thing anyway, but just for what it's worth. 
thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about it. <laughs> Is there any other questions? Um, okay, so I'd ask for someone to please thank you. All, all those in favour? Thank you. Anyone against? Thank you. Unanimously carried. Um, because it's about re-electing me, I have to step aside. I'm conflicted. <laughs> I'll ask Mr. Wakeman to take the chair. Thank you. So as Jeff foreshadowed, the next item on the agenda relates to the re-election and election of directors in the company. Uh, there's commentary uh, relating to Mr. Levy in the notice of meeting and in Cromwell's 2014 annual report, which I'll take as having been read. Um, the resolution reads that Mr Jeff Levy, who retires by rotation in accordance with the company's constitution and offers himself for re-election, is re-elected as a director of the company. Um, you've got on the screen in front of you the proxies. just wonder if anybody would like to speak to the resolution, to the motion. Um, would any security holder care to move? Item three being the election, the election, Mr. Levy. Thank you. Um, all those in favour? Thank you. All those against? Thank you. Declare the motion unanimously carried. Um, thank you. I'll pass it back to Jeff. Thank Congratulations. You. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, moving on, we're going to now. Um, ask you to elect a, a new director of the board, Mrs. Ms. Ms. Jane Tongs, who's actually sitting here in front of us. Um, and um, the resolution reads that Ms. Jane Tongs, who is eligible and having offered herself for election, is elected as a director of the company. Here are the proxies. Um, would any security holder like to speak in relation to this resolution? Noting that in the information we sent out to you and in my earlier speech we gave a lot of background on Jane, but if there's anyone who would, please feel free. All right. Um, could I please have a, a, a mover? Thank you. All right. All those in favor, please hold up your voting cards. Anyone against? No. I declared uh, the motion unanimously carried. and. Would like to welcome Jane officially as, as a director. Thank you. Um, the next item is to elect Mr. Andrew Koenig, who unfortunately you're not meeting today because for the same reasons as Mark Wayne, I couldn't get you because of something that come up in South Africa. He's, uh, he's also not available. Uh, but but um, again, we've told you a bit about him. You've read what's in there. Um, he effectively is replacing Mike, who um, who will be spending more time in London and and Andrew will be available as well. So now, um, is there anybody who who's happy to, or before I do that, would anyone like to talk to the motion? No. Uh, do, do I have a mover? Anyone? Thank you. All right. All those in favour? Anyone against? Uh, unanimously carried, thank you, and we will let uh, Mr. Connick know that he has been elected as a director. Um, that really brings us down to, oh, I need to say that in accordance with the requirements of sections 250S, I now offer a further reasonable opportunity for questions and comments of the management of the company or of the auditor. So if there's Last chance to ask four more questions. Otherwise, we will be moving out and, and people will be around and you'll have an opportunity to ask any of the directors or management that, that are here any questions as well. So um, um, if anyone doesn't mind, we'll, we'll move on on this. So in the absence of any other business that can be brought, I'd like to close this meeting. And um, thank you very much for your attendance. We greatly appreciate it and uh, look forward to seeing you all again next year if not sooner. Thank you. Thank you.